Good morning, church, and, and happy New Year, uh, or happy New Year's Eve, I guess it's today. Uh, you know, I, I love the message of that, of that video. Uh, it's so true that we are all kind of lost in the woods uh, until somebody comes and, and finds us and helps us find that lasting purpose that really God intended us to have. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are people in your life who really do come along that way, and, and for, for my wife and I, one of those, those couples was, was Amy and Marcus Overstreet. Um, and it's so, so great to have you guys with us. Um, you know, we, we were, amen. As, as Tuan said, you know, they, they, Amy and Marcus are, are on a mission uh, to seek and save the people who are lost in Scotland, uh, in Edinburgh, Scotland. And they've done an incredible job over there. And it was great to see them um, kind of just uh, go on an adventure. And it gave us great hope and great faith that really life has called us to, to step out on faith. Um, and to do things and explore things that we never thought we could explore. And so, man, when I watch that video, I really do think about Marcus and Amy um, in such a great way. So I love you guys a lot. Um, we're, we're on a series on the topic of, of purpose, uh, and we've been discovering the whys in our lives. That's sort of the, the theme that we've been going with, discovering the whys in our lives. Uh, but today we aren't going to ask a why question. Instead, I want to ask you this. What do you want in 2018? What do you want? The new year starts tomorrow, and so what do you want? It's not rhetorical. I'm just kidding. It is rhetorical. <laughs> Is it a what? Are you thinking of something that you want? Is it a who? Someone you want to get closer to, or maybe build a friendship with, or pursue? Is it a feeling that you want? You, you want to feel loved, you want to, feel, you want to remove that loneliness, you want to get out of that depression. What do you want? All of us want something. Maybe for you it's a better relationship with your kids this year. Maybe some of you want to go on an experience. Maybe most of us want to get in shape. Maybe you want to be a little bit more disciplined. Maybe it's, a, it's, it's something you want to feel a little bit more fulfilled. You want to feel a bit more like you're really sig having significance in your life. Maybe you want a boyfriend. Or maybe you want a girlfriend. Or maybe you want your boyfriend to ask you to marry you. <laughs> Amen, brothers. <laughs> we all want something, and so what do you want? Something comes to mind. And what's interesting about this question is that it's kind of a tricky question, isn't it? I like to write down my New Year's goals every year. Um, I, like to, I try to be specific when I write them down. I try to write down things that I think are going to, like, I can really achieve this. I want to be closer in my friendship with this person. Or I, I want to try to drive a different car. Or, you know, and, and as I was growing up, these were some of the things that I wrote down. And so I found my 18-year-old journal a couple of years ago. The things I wanted when I was 18 years old. And it was a little stroll down memory lane. I wrote down the career I wanted to pursue. I wanted to be a basketball player. I wrote down the place I wanted to live. I wanted to live in New York. Not doing either of those two things. I, I, I wrote down the car I wanted to drive. I wanted to drive a 1972 Volkswagen bus. I even wrote down the name of the high school girl I wanted to marry. And I'm not going to say her name because she may be watching online. <laughs> And as I read it, I, I, I realized um, that I was very thankful for unanswered prayers. <laughs> because isn't that the way, the, go, the way it goes? You know, this question is really tricky. Because what you want today may not be what you want tomorrow. And what you wanted yesterday isn't what you want today. High school reunions are a great illustration for this. You go back to a high school reunion, and, and ladies, uh, there's that guy from high school that you definitely wanted to marry. And you showed up, and he walked up to you, and he said, hey, and he knew your name, and, he looked at, and you looked at his name tag, and then you looked at his face, and you thought, he must have picked up the wrong name tag. <laughs> that, that guy, Brad, he was in shape. But now, you're mature. <laughs> But in high school, you know, you fought your parents. You fought all the advice. You said, that's the guy I'm definitely going to end up with. He's the guy I definitely want to marry. But now he stands in front of you and you think, thank God you didn't answer that prayer, Lord. <laughs> that's the nature of wants. Wants can be tricky. And what's inter interesting about that is that we put a lot of faith in our wants, don't we? What we're sure, what we're so sure that we want 
We fight for, we fight nail and teeth so we can have it. The things that you thought would make everything better if you just got it. You put a lot of faith in your wants. You just had to have it. You know, if I just got my way here, if this situation just turned out the, a little bit better, if I could just experience that thing, then I'd really feel fulfilled. If I could just make a bit more money, then all that stress would go away. If I could just find a spouse, if I could get out of this marriage, if my kids would be better behaved, if my situation was a little bit different, if it was the way I really wanted it, if I could get out of my parents' house, whatever it is for you, we have a lot of faith in our, in our wants, don't we? If I could just get what I want, then things would be better. But have you ever noticed that at the end of a want, there's always another want? At the end of a want, there's always something else that you want. You say, well, if I could have that, and you get it, and then there's something else that you want. And so this want question is kind of tricky. And here's the thing. You can also get what you want, but it isn't really, but it isn't always what you really want. Notice that? The nuance there. You can get what you want, but it isn't always what you really want. And we all have stories of us getting what we wanted, and it, and it ended up being exactly what we didn't want. We got, we maxed out that credit card because we really wanted that television. And now we're not very satisfied with our lives. We leased that car. As a matter of fact, you know, you don't, doesn't every single regret in life begin with a want? You wanted that, you got it, and now that you regret that you got it. You wanted to try that thing, you wanted to have it your own way. You know, maybe it was sex. You know, I wanted to experience that, that a sexual relationship with somebody. I wanted to get in bed with them, and you, and you did it, and now you regret it. Or maybe it was using some drugs. You thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after it. I'm going to get the fix. It's going to be awesome. And now you regret that you ever did it. It's drinking. That might be that one night you thought it was going to be the best night of my life, and now you've regretted it for the rest of your life. You rushed into it, and now you have these deep wounds. Your conscience is full of wounds because you got what you wanted. Man, wants, it's a tricky question. You slept with the guy, you cut that class, you bought that house, you ate that last bit of ice cream. <laughs> you did the thing you wanted to do, but now you're full of regret, and you're on the toilet of your life. <laughs> And that's basically regret. <laughs> regret is the feeling. I would love to be able to go back in time and not get what I wanted. I'd like to go back in time and not sign that lease. I'd like to go back in time and not move my family. I'd like to go back in time and not take that job. I'd like to go back in time and not get that divorce. I'd like to go back in time and listen to that advice. I got what I thought I wanted, but as a result, I didn't really get what I wanted. And so I ask you again, what do you want in 2018? It's tricky, isn't it? And maybe you're thinking, okay, everything you mentioned didn't include me. And you're sure about what you really want. And there's a path that everybody is advising you not to take. That everybody's telling you, don't go in that direction. But you're like, I really want it. It's really going to fulfill me. And so if you're one of those people, or if you've ever dealt with wants in your life and struggling with that, I, I want to maybe spend the next 20 minutes or so and just encourage us to have a new perspective on the way we view what we want. And this is the big idea of the sermon. We will never get what we really want until we discover what God wants for us. We can search all the caverns of pleasure, the caves of desire, and we will never find what truly fulfills until we discover what God wants for us. What really, what we really want lurks in an area of our lives that we really don't often explore when we're thinking about wants. And so we end up spending most of our time searching for meaning and purpose and fulfillment in the areas of life where they cannot be found. Like reeds, we get blown back and forth controlled by the winds of circumstances, controlled by the, by the waves of our desire. And what we're going to see in two passages today is that what we really, really, really want can only be discovered if we realize what God wants for us. You can turn your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes.
about a thousand years before Jesus, the book of Ecclesiastes is written by King Solomon. Solomon was David's son, and Ecclesiastes represents sort of like an autobiography of Solomon's life. Solomon, who, who much, for his life, much of his life lived in the pursuit of personal wants, uh, Solomon was one of the richest and most powerful people in the ancient world. He would have been like sort of a, a billionaire in today's standards. He had everything he wanted. He had wealth and power, success, land, influence. He was one of the most powerful people in the world, one of the richest people in the world, one of the most influential people in the world. And at the end of his autobiographical work, we're going to look at Ecclesiastes 12, Solomon concludes his findings about life and the pursuit of wants. And this is what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 8. He says this, Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Now this is a very encouraging scripture. <laughs> you read this and you feel like, man, I feel secure in my, my life. But what he's trying to say is that all the stuff that he wanted, all the stuff that he pursued, all the stuff that he and I and you, we, all the stuff that we get, all the stuff we work for and we achieve in our life has very little meaning. Detached, especially rather if God is not involved in it. It's a bit discouraging of a point, but it's a powerful revelation. And it's relevant for what we're talking about today. This word meaningless is translated a bunch of different ways in different English Bibles. Some of them say vanity, some of it says futility, some of it says useful, and others say meaningless, as our version says. And they all come back to the Hebrew word which is translated this word hevel. That's the word. That's not how it's spelled because that's English, but it's, it's the word hevel. It's used 37 times in the book, and it's directly translated as this word vapor, breath. And so what Solomon is saying is that all of the stuff that you and I want, all of the wants of the world, all of the pleasures of the world are like vapor. You try to grab hold of them and it slips through your hands. You try to find some substance in the vapor of life, but it all slips away. You look for meaning in it. You put your joy in it. You put your faith in it. You look for significance in it and all the pleasures of life. All you want is, I want the vapor. I want the vapor. You're looking for it. You're trying to grab it, but it just keeps slipping away. Meaningless. It's all just vapor. He says in a different area of the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 1, verse 14, he says, I have seen all these things that are under the sun. All of them are hevel, vapor, meaningless, a chasing after the wind. This teaching speaks a truth that we are, are already really aware of in our experience in life. You always are searching for the next thing, the next pleasure, the next want. It's always like chasing after the, the wind though, isn't it? Because you never really catch it. That thing that you want, as I said before, there's always a thing after the thing that you want. He said, you know what, if I could just have it, if I could just get it, if I could just figure it out, if this situation would change, if, if this whole thing would just be a little bit more to my liking, a little bit more to my wanting, then life would be better. But Solomon says, I've had it all, and it's all a chasing after the wind. You hope that it would produce some set significance and some satisfaction in your life, but it's just chasing after the wind. There's no lasting joy, there's no fulfillment in anything apart from God. You can have all the wealth in the world. You could have a great career, high social status. You can have pleasures on top of pleasures on top of pleasures, but all of the wants in our lives are just a chasing after the wind. C.S. Lewis, oops. C.S. Lewis was a British author who lived during the Second World War. And the cool thing about C.S. Lewis, if you're someone that comes from, maybe you don't have a lot of faith, or maybe you're just exploring Christianity, uh, something that's really great about C.S. Lewis was that uh, he wasn't, he was, a, he was an atheist, he was a, well, agnostic, uh, before he became a Jesus follower. And so he didn't really grow up in the church, and C.S. Lewis doesn't have uh, the same sort of perspective that we have. He actually has a really unique one because he didn't grow up in the church. And one of the most interesting ideas he had was what he thought hell would be like. It's in a little book called The Great Divorce. It actually happens to be my favorite book. 
And it's an allegory on, on what hell is like. And again, because he didn't grow up in the church, he kind of strips away all the imagery about hell. All that medieval imagery that you think about hell, the, the fire and all that stuff. And he, does, he doesn't really talk about revelation. And then he just kind of strips it away and just creates an allegory about what he thinks hell would be like. And in this book, what he basically says is that hell is a place where everybody gets everything they want. And all you have to do is think about it. And you get everything you've ever wanted. And for some of us who are listening, we're like, that's heaven. <laughs> Glory Lord. <laughs> if I could just find a place where I got everything I wanted, that would be amazing. But in this allegory, hell is a place where you got everything you wanted. And he describes this neighborhood. And in this neighborhood, there is just city block after city block after city block that's completely empty. It's neighborhoods that are completely empty where people are living so far away from each other because every time someone wanted something and the other person didn't want for them, they just said, I'll move away from you. And so what happens is hell is just this widespread, this, this whole neighborhood of people who have everything they ever wanted, big houses, all the, the relationships they could ever have, every, everything they ever wanted, all the drugs and all, everything you could ever want, they put in there. And you can just, you think about it and you got it. And, and what C.S. Lewis says is that that's actually hell. The thing you think about that you would want is really just a neighborhood of hell. And his point is our point. And it's not only his point and our point, but it's Solomon's point. And throughout the Bible, we see scriptures talking about this idea that you could have everything you want, and if you got everything you wanted, and those desires in you are actually what's damaging your life. There's another great passage in James chapter 4. It says this, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? He says, where does the conflict of your life come from? And he says, where, where does it come from? Doesn't it come from what you want? He says, inside of you and inside of me, there is a war of wants. I want something. I want people to act a certain way towards me. I want people to respond to me a certain way. I want people to like me. I want people sometimes to get out of the way of me. I, I want certain, certain things. I want people to respect me and respect my space. I want people to honor me. I want, I want my boss sometimes, uh, actually, this, I'm not even going to say this. Maybe you want your boss to give you a raise. You know? <laughs> I want my, my friends to say they're sorry after they do something wrong to me. And so what James is saying is what, what causes the tension? What causes the tension in your life? in your relationships? What causes that relational tension? What's the source of the tension in your marriage? What's the source of the conflict between you and your son, between you and your daughter, between you and your parents, between you and your brothers and sisters? He says, ultimately, the source of that tension, the source is the things that you want. When I was a kid, my, my dad would say to me, he would actually say it to my mom or my sister or my brothers in front of me, but not to me. You know that? He would say, he, would say, he only does whatever he wants to do. And he would say that about me, and I was always so offended. And I would stand there, and I would sit, and, and, and I would never say it because I have Spanish parents, but I, but I felt... <laughs> but, what I, but what I felt was, no, I don't want to do what you want me to do. It's not that I will do whatever I want to do. It's, no, I don't want to do what you want me to do. And so there was always tension between me and my dad. I wanted to do what I wanted to do, and he wanted, to, he wanted me to do what he wanted me to do. And, and, and amen, kids, you should obey that. But, but, that's, but that was, that's where the tension lied. It lied in our wants. He was exactly correct. I only wanted to do the things I wanted to do. And James is saying, just like Solomon is saying, he's saying, look, your wants are ruining you. Your wants are ruining you. The thing that you want so bad is hurting the relationship that you really want. The thing that you want so bad is actually damaging your life in a way that nothing else could really damage it. That tension, that anger, the frustration of your life is all tied to your wants. He goes on and James takes it a step further. He says, look, you, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. And this is where we all check out. We're like, I've never killed anybody. James, you're wrong. 
Okay, well, let's take it figuratively then. Haven't you seen somebody destroy a marriage because of they, want, they wanted something so bad? They wanted to sleep with that coworker so badly. And now they've killed that marriage. The marriage is destroyed. They wanted it so bad, and so the marriage is destroyed. Haven't you see, seen someone kill an opportunity? A student on scholarship. He wanted to sleep in. He wanted to cut class. And so he killed his opportunity to get a free education. Haven't you seen somebody kill relationships by never apologizing? Because they didn't ever want to apologize, and so they ruined a relationship? You know, this is right on what James is saying. James is saying that, look, your desires have killed the relationships in your life. Your desires have killed what you really want. And see, these unchecked wants have a way of ruining your life. And, and, and this is an idea that I've been tossing around a lot. You, you may get what you want, but it's rarely what you really want. In all these situations, you may get what you wanted, but it's rarely what you really wanted. And see, for most of us, in the moment, we thought that the thing that we really wanted was that thing. We thought that that affair, that that partying, that that even abortion or divorce was what we really wanted. And we fought for it, and we fought for it, and we fought for it, and it turned out to be exactly what we didn't want. Man, this want question is tricky. And so what I want to present to you is this idea, and then I want to go back to Ecclesiastes and just look at it for a moment. I want to present to you this one idea that, that what you really want is not found in your wants. And so this is crazy. <laughs> and I've used the word want a lot. What you really want is not found in what you want. But what you really want is found in what God wants for you. And here's what it is. If you go back and look at Ecclesiastes, Solomon finally concludes all his thoughts. The book of Ecclesiastes lands on this idea. And this is what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. He says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. I'm going to read that again. He says, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Someone says, Solomon says that after a lifetime of living for his wants, after a lifetime of getting everything he could ever desire in his life, after a lifetime of living in such a way where everything was at his disposal, he says, here is the conclusion. What you really want, what you really want is a relationship with God. He says, what you really want is to be close to him, to fear him, to know him, to live in awe of him, to understand him, and then to keep his commandments. He says, what you really want lurks in a realm that you rarely explore. What you, what you are made to do and what I am made to do, what will give me purpose in my life is to love God, to fear him, and to do what he has commanded me to do. You will never find out what you really want until you discover what God wants for you. Don't trust your purpose. Don't trust your purpose to every bit of emotion that comes your way. Can you trust your emotions? Can you really trust what you want? Those things are fickle. They're so fickle. One day they're here and the next day they're gone. What Solomon says is here's the conclusion. Fear God. Love Him. Honor Him. Give Him your life. And then do what He says. And then you will discover what you really, really want. And notice... This isn't about what God wants from you. A lot of people come into a relationship with God and they're like, well, God wants me to do this, 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 this. And it's not really about that. God doesn't need anything from you. He's God. It's really more about what God wants for you. He's saying that your obedience is going to lead to a fulfilled life. 
Jesus said it himself. He says, I have come to give you life that you may have it to the full. And if you know him, if you fear him, if you honor him, you're going to have a life that's so significant, that's so meaningful. You're going to get what you really want, which is fulfillment and purpose. See, Solomon, like Jesus, like all the prophets, like the scriptures, are trying to warn us not to make the same tragic error that so many other generations have made, where we put our faith in our wants. Because we know this, if we live for our wants, we're never going to find true and lasting fulfillment. But if we live for God, we will find significance. And you think, you know what, I can be successful without God. And that's right, you certainly can. You can have a successful career without God. You can, have a, you can even have a successful marriage without God. But what I'm saying is that you'll never have significance without God. And so here's the review. Getting what you want, but not what you really want, leads to a life of wanting. <laughs> Getting all the stuff you want, but never what you really want, will leave your life wanting. But getting what God has called you, going after what God has called you to go after, loving him and loving and keeping his commandments will be the centerpiece of a life of fulfillment. If you want to find joy, if you want to find fulfillment, you have to find it in your relationship with God. So I want to leave you with a practical application. This year, as you're writing your New Year's goals, as you're writing the things that you're looking forward to the New Year's, and maybe you don't do that, so I want to encourage you to do that this year. Have scripture in mind as you're writing those goals. When you're thinking about what you want to do, don't write what type of career you want to have and what guy you want to marry or any of those things. God will figure that all, all that stuff out. Instead, write them with scriptures in mind. Write them with Matthew 28, 18 in mind, that you want to make a disciple of all nations. Write them with the, the passage of scripture in mind that talks about how Jesus goes away to lonely places to pray. Man, maybe this year you can have more time with God. You can find more personal time. Write your New Year's goals with scriptures in mind. And brothers and sisters, I really do believe that God is going to refine our character and refine our wants so that we get ultimately what we really want. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing one more song, and then you can enjoy your New Year's Eve.